Welcome to Justice Counts, the podcast that goes beyond the law to what's important to you. Equal justice for all is a guidepost for our nation, but how do we achieve that? Here are your hosts, writer-commentator Bob Gaddy and novelist-attorney Mark M. Bello. Thanks for joining us today on Justice Counts. I'm Bob Gaddy. Today we're with Michael A. Bryant, managing partner of the Minnesota law firm of Bradshaw and Bryant, where he represents clients suffering from minor, serious, and catastrophic injuries. Mr. Bryant has extensive experience negotiating with insurance companies as well as litigating personal injury and wrongful death claims throughout Minnesota. He was named MTLA Trial Lawyer of the Year. In the premier episode of Justice Counts, we spoke with Michael about his representation of Catholic Church sexual abuse victims. Today, we're focusing more on his overall practice, especially in this era of COVID-19 and the impact the pandemic has had on the pursuit of justice. Here's Mark Bello. Well, Michael, good to see you. How's the practice going? But, you know, it's going good. I mean, I, I have uh, run my practice primarily on trying cases, and we haven't tried a case in over a year and a half. I mean, I typically tried between about five and seven trials a year. And, you know, I just haven't been able to get to trial because of, of what's going on. It's just been a problem. Uh, I hear you. How long have you been an attorney now, Michael? I became an attorney in 1991. I'd worked for a personal injury law firm starting in 88. So I've been doing personal injury since 88. I became an attorney in 91. I got sworn in on a Friday. I was in court Monday morning. Your um, your website is quite a nice site. Uh, people will okay. want to go to it, I would assume. Would you let them know where they can find you? Sure. It's minnesotapersonalinjury.com. That's all one word, minnesotapersonalinjury.com. And you, you practice law all over the, the state of Minnesota or just in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area? No, all over the state. I've been in court in all but five counties in the state, and I've tried cases in all, but I think it's 11 or 12 right now. Mike, what's the focus of your law practice? Uh, primarily, we do plaintiff personal injury. Um, we historically have always done some criminal. I started doing criminal at the beginning, um, and John Bradshaw, who started the firm long before I got there, did a bunch of criminal. And then in about, oh, in about... 08 or 09, I started getting involved in survivor cases with, with uh, sexual abuse cases um, because Jeff Anderson, who's a nationally or internationally known lawyer, was dealing with cases here in the St. Cloud area uh, with a place called St. John's um, University or St. John's Academy, which is where uh, kids were getting abused a long time ago. And so the practice is primarily plaintiff's personal injury, but I do a decent amount of survivor cases. What? does a civil trial specialist designation mean? And more importantly, what does it mean to you? Yeah, um, what it is, is there's a certain requirement. You have to have so many trials in order to qualify. And I'm certified both by the state and I'm certified uh, nationally with uh, the national group. So I've been certified in both groups because I've tried so many cases. And then I had to take a test at one point um, I don't remember how long ago it was, but when I took the test, I remember walking out of that test saying, I've never taken another written test. I don't care. <laughs> and so if I fail it, I fail, but I passed and uh, became a certified trial specialist. I'm, I'm dean right now of the, uh, certified cat the Academy of Certified Trial Lawyers. Um, and it just means that we've reached a certain level. I went in to uh, a group called the BOTA, which is American Board of Cer Civil Trial Specialists, at the highest level with 100 trials underneath my belt. Um, and I've just tried lots of cases over time. And, and uh, those are the qualifications that allow us in Minnesota to say we're certified. So some personal injury lawyers call themselves trial lawyers, but you actually can call yourself a trial lawyer, correct? I mean, like <laughs> I said, I haven't tried a case in a year and a half. And so I feel right. right now, I feel like- Well, no, know, nobody I'm, has I'm with fake. COVID, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. So an, ac an accident, uh, you know, people don't really appreciate this, but an accident, uh, and it, this is on your website, by the way, uh, can in, in, a, in an instant uh, dramatically change someone's life. Uh, yeah, I realize this is a kind of a broad question, but 
these life changing events. Can you tell us what you mean when you put those on your website? And how can a trial lawyer make a difference in these situations? Well, uh, the first thing is, you know, very rarely does someone come in and say, ah, I was in an accident. It worked out perfectly with everything I had going on because I needed a break. Um, what happens is, you know, everything's going along normal and then suddenly somebody changes your life by injuring you. And when you get injured, you have medical bills or you have inability to work and, you know, people start worrying about the future as far as what they're going to do and how they're going to get care and how they're going to get things paid for. Um, typically what happens, the questions that people have right off the bat is what's it going to cost me to talk to a lawyer? Because they have a belief that if they call me, I'm going to charge them and it's a free consultation. Second is for whatever reason, people get a whole bunch of legal advice that when you look at it, it's just wrong. I mean, they just get wrong information. They get wrong information from insurance adjusters. They get wrong information from their friends and they just get wrong information from everybody. And so you want to go and find out what your rights are and what's involved. And, and depending on where it happened and what state it is, we have in Minnesota something called no fault law, which allows for people to get their medical bills and their wage loss paid to a certain amount that you want to find out what rights you have and what coverages you have. And like I said, it's a free consultation. And that's generally what I do when I start off with people is talk to them about those rights. Michigan, Michigan has a, an unlimited no fault law. Correct. Uh, Minnesota's is it Minnesota has a limited ours capped law, ours capped at 20 unless you stack it and you have extra coverages um okay, but and, but you know it, it's done in different ways but correct that's one of those examples that depending on what state it is can have a big impact on what what potential coverages you have big controversy in Michigan they just changed the no-fault law and created a whole bunch of restrictions on uh, cost control on medical and the ability for the public to buy limits on no fault, which as you know, will automatically mean that the public will buy limits on no fault because it saves the money on premiums. And yeah, nobody thinks they're sold. going to get involved in an accident. Yeah, that's what so, they get sold too. You know, they go into most agents and they say, you know, get me whatever good coverage I need. And they just get sold that, you know, the, we cheap, get, the cheap, the cheapest I can get. Yeah, we get examples of that in motorcycle cases in Minnesota, because motorcycles don't have no fault in Minnesota because um, they're exempt and people go in there and say get me whatever coverage I need for my motorcycle and the agents sell them stuff that you know is way below yeah. what they need for coverage yeah you've been you've been practicing law now if I do the math uh, this is your 30th year yes correct that would be 30 years yes well happy September. anniversary talk to me about insurance companies and corporate defendants in general 30 years so not in 1991 was there a substantial difference between how carriers and companies behaved in litigation that compared to how they are today? Well, they were still on kind of a fiscal year. So you'd, you'd have back when I started, you had this time period where you'd settle tons of cases in, in November, December, and then there'd be kind of this gap in January, February, March, where people were off on vacation. I don't see that anymore. Now it's kind of a year around thing and they're not really set up on fiscal years anymore. Um, second is, um, it, it you see lots of up and downs. I mean, I've been doing this long enough that you see time periods where companies seem to be paying fairly, or or if you fight them, they'll they'll pay you what you're supposed to on cases. And then you'll see every once in a while they'll go through these ideas where they decide I'm not going to pay anything for a while, and they don't, you know. And so you end up having to put a lot more cases into suit. You know, we suddenly had the first time ever where we couldn't get to trial. So, you know, like one of my big hammers was I'll try the case is gone. And so you had a combination of not being able to get there to hammer them. And two, you've also had a, a, a group of defense lawyers that used to make money driving to depositions or driving to stuff that no longer were getting that money. So they're figuring out new ways to bill stuff. And, you know, it's, it, it hurts the, the person with the claim because you got all these people trying to make things work for them in certain ways that have nothing to do with their case, but have everything to do with getting their case done. I, you know, I've, I've been practicing a little bit longer than you for uh, 45 years almost. And I, I, you know, back in the seventies and eighties, when I started, uh, there was a much more, it's almost like politics. It was much more good old boy, conciliatory. You could resolve a case. You could go to a hotel and resolve five cases with the same adjuster. Uh, there was a much more uh, 
laid back atmosphere in, in handling and resolving litigation. I found more recently in the 2000s, in the 21st century, kind of a declaration of war. Have you found that in Minnesota or no? At times, you know, there's been some companies that every once in a while will do that, you know, and they'll decide we're going to fight all these cases and then they try a bunch. Usually, eventually, the, the, the jury verdicts kind of level things out. They get hit a couple of times hard and then they realize, ah, let's start settling cases and get things done. Um, it was weird because, you know, it, it was horrible to see the number of companies who were closing their offices and sending people to work from home, say, five years ago. And actually, in the last year, those are the companies that were easier to deal with because people were already set up at home. So it wasn't different for them. Yeah. And so it's it just it, it, it just goes up and down and varies. Um, I mean, you see the effect of the economy. Sometimes when the economy's real up, jurors aren't as aren't as uh, as good because sometimes jurors are like, "Well, everybody can get a job, and you don't have to worry about a job." And then when the economy's real down, sometimes jurors will be better during those time periods. The more cases you try, but it, it it just you watch cycles and it goes through these different cycles. So I wouldn't say that for sure it's one way or the other, but you know who knows. What percentage of your cases are actually tried? Oh, I still try. I mean, I still only try, you know, five to seven cases a year when I'm trying cases. So it's still a really small percentage. I have more cases in suit uh, than a lot of people because I'll just put them into suit. Um, it was interesting. Minnesota, a number of years ago, for I think for business law reasons, created the system because Minnesota is what's called a service state versus a filing state which means that we just serve people and we don't have to file it right away, where in other states you file it first. Minnesota put in this law that you had to file within a year. And I never had a problem with that because people knew I'd try the case. So they didn't sit there and say, is it in suit or did you file it? They knew I'd try it. Um, where you know the lawyers who weren't trying cases, who weren't filing cases, they probably had a bigger problem with that during that time period. Well, I always felt that that if you don't file a case, if you screw around with it, with an adjuster who eventually denies you, you've wasted six months or eight months or a year of your client's time uh, that could have been building your uh, trial date closer. So I always, I, I'm with you. I always filed the cases as early as possible. Yeah, his, historically, I had a couple situations where, you know, I trusted adjusters and thought they'll get back to me. And, and then they found out they were just playing games from the beginning. Yeah, you, you, so, can get, you, can get you, know, a, you can get a vibe. Typically, I'll go through one or two rounds in, in settlement negotiations and give the client the, here's where it's going. If you're interested in that, I'll try to get it done. If you're not interested in that, let's put into suit and get things rolling in that way. What about our alternative dispute resolution? Do you use a lot of mediations and arbitrations? It's required in Minnesota. You have to go through ADR in order to get to trial. So we have mediations in every case. Um, and it, it, it's a crazy thing because there's one mediator I use a lot. And every once in a while I have companies like, I don't want to use him. You use him too much. It's like, well, he settles cases. Unless our goal is to not settle the case, why is that a problem? You know, and I, it, it goes, you know, sometimes it seems easier to get it done without a mediation and other times you need to get there so that they can go through the back and forth dancing that takes place. And sometimes to clients, it looks like nonsense. Um, in the last year, we've done a lot of mediations by Zoom. They haven't been in person. So that's been a little bit different. And at times that's led to some that blow up real quickly and they're done. And other times it's led to, you know, cases getting settled just like normal. So, so you know, like anything else, it's had its benefits in both good and bad. Just out of curiosity, do you, do you see a lot of difference between uh, a Zoom mediation and an in-person mediation? It's all case by case. You know, there's certain times when you're sitting there with the client and you're able to deal with stuff with the client that helps in getting cases settled. You know, just because you're there, there's that, they don't have that distance that they can kind of hide behind and, and, and be tougher or, or make decisions differently. So, so there's sometimes that and other times it's like no difference at all. I mean, I've always tried to, at the beginning of mediation, inform my clients of basically everything. So they know what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, you know, keep them updated as far as it goes. And I think that's important because the mediator doesn't have to come in and explain to them the process. 
they're not shocked by, you know, what the first number is, because I talk to them about, you know, the way that we look at numbers and, and the key on it is where we end up, not where we start, you know, they can, they can start at a penny, we can start at a billion, it doesn't matter, we're going to get to a point, they're going to say this is the top number. So I, I really try to bring down the, the stress by a client going into mediation, because in the end, the only thing they have to do is at the, is decide, do I take the money or walk? That's it. That's the only real decision in a case. And the rest of it isn't really decisions. It's just trying to move it to make it work. During COVID, uh, there are a few lawyers who are actually trying cases remotely. Uh, do you see yourself doing that? Well, there are family law lawyers that were doing it, that were doing court trials. Um, I know that they've attempted a couple of jury trials by Zoom, but boy, without knowing what your jury's doing or knowing who else is involved in your decision making, I don't know how you would do that. Um, and I haven't, I, I had a couple judges kind of throw that out as a little bit of a possibility, but we haven't reached a point where we did any of that. I mentioned mediation and arbitration. Arbitration is obviously, as you and I know, a very different animal. I don't think the people understand the differences. Can you tell uh, our listeners the difference between mediation and arbitration and when you would use an arbitration? Yeah, well, one of the things, since we have no fault in Minnesota, you can arbitrate it as long as you start off less than $10,000. It can grow after you file it. So we do, our office usually does about, does about two to five no fault arbs a week. We do them all the time. Um, it's a it's a fast process. The difference between an arbitration and mediation is in an arbitration, someone makes a decision. So it's a fact finder like a jury. But in this case, it's usually a lawyer, one person who makes a decision in the same way if you had a court trial, the judge makes the decision. That's separate than a mediation where all it is is a person who goes is an in-between that talks to both sides that basically gives you the good and the bad so that you can try to get a case settled, they, but they don't make a decision. That decision is made by the person in the room, whatever room, how much money they're going to offer and if they're going to take it or not. Um, the good thing I like about ARBs, and I, I, I got taught this a long time ago is stuff, most clients never get a chance to really see us do our job. You know, they can come into your office and they can see a bunch of plaques and they can hear you or they can listen to the podcast and say, oh, he tries lots of cases. He knows what he's doing, but they don't get to see you do anything really, where if you do an arbitration, they see you fight for them. They see how you are. They see how you argue things. They, they see in ways of how you think. And it's, it's not unusual for people after I do a no-fault arb to suddenly be like, you know, I'm with you. If you think we should settle the third party case, meaning the case against the defendant, I'm completely fine because they saw you do it and they feel more confident in you that you know what you're doing. What would cause you to choose arbitration over uh pursuing the case in court and getting a and potentially getting a trial um the amount of speed that's involved in it you know you have to do no fault arbs in in if it's less than 10,000 in Minnesota so we do all those i mean i can do a no fault arb we can file one today and right now we're getting calendars in i would say let's see right now we're probably getting calendars september october november so by the time we pick an arbitrator it'll be done by december the no fault arb um, I have one paralegal who only works on no fault arb. So she does the books and I, I dictate the, the main parts of it, but she puts the books together. So there's a speed involved. There's a simplicity involved. You know, a no fault arb for me can take 20 minutes at most. Um, and the client's done and client gets a chance to testify and client gets a chance to, to, to put stuff. So there's an advantage in the timing. Um, for a personal injury case against a defendant, the keys for me would be timing, how clean the case is. Um, and there's certain cases you think it'd be better to have an arbitrator make a decision. You're going to lose the home run that a jury might give you. But alternatively, you're also going to lose. You're not going to have the bad jury that's going to show up and just hammer you as a result. Where an arbitrator is going to look at it and they're going to know certain things. They're going to know how insurance works or they're going to know what gets subtracted from a verdict. So they, they have a built-in way that when they make a decision, they know the effect that it has where a jury doesn't have any idea on that. It might also be based on how large the insurance policy is Absolutely. for the defendant that you're chasing, yes? 
Absolutely. I mean, you know, one of the concerns for defense will be that they don't get hit for what's called bad faith for amounts over and above right. the policy. So they'll be willing to give you a high low of the, the top number be in the policy in, in return for protecting their own, their own person. And oftentimes they won't fight liability in those cases, which is fault. And they'll just go into damages. Also, you know, you do things by reports with doctors. So, you know, doctors that you'd spend maybe $5,000 to depose for trial and to testify, you just put in their report and, you know, you, you argue right off the report. Without naming names, uh, you might do that to avoid a particular uh, biased against plaintiff judge, yes? Um. Or no, I, I in Minnesota you don't really see that. There's counties where there's some issues concerning the juries, you know. So there's certain places where I'd be more concerned about certain types of cases with certain juries, um, in that they're more they tend to be more, um, you know, and it, it's a loaded word, but more conservative as far as the way they look at damages. So that so there's issues on on jurors, but very rarely do we is there an issue with judges that that I'd be concerned about in Minnesota. So there's no there's no uh, corporate or insurance company bias uh, on the bench. Um, I, I think you'd see more of that with appeals. Um, uh, you could see more of that with potentially, you know, issues that come out of the appellate courts. But as far as the bench goes, I don't really see a lot that I'd be worried about. You know, there, there might be certain cases that I'd be more concerned about wanting to strike a judge because of a type of case. But overall, no, I, I, I think the judges, I mean, we've got some, some very good trial benches here. And, and one of the things is that, that helps in trying cases is you get judges that bring their clerks in to watch you and they believe you're good at trying cases and they let you do more when they think you're, you know what you're doing, you know? Yeah, so. I, it's, it's so important to not just talk the talk, but to walk the walk. That's absolutely. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Take a situation, you've got a, a seriously injured client, for some reason or other, the law is against them. They're not going to get the full measure of their damages. How do you deal with a client like that? And, and what do you tell them? Uh, how do you soften the blow? How do you personally deal and sleep at night when you've got a client who just isn't going to get justice? Yeah, that's, that's really, really hard. Um, and that's trying to figure out what is justice. You know, I, 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 the best example I can give of that is, you know, when you, when you're doing criminal work and you're pleading somebody guilty, you know, I, I always kind of have this little bit of feeling when I plead somebody guilty that I've given up that I've somehow, you know, I, I've, 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 uh, you know, not done my job for him because we ended up, you know, putting a plea in. Um, but you do it because it makes sense or you do it because when you look at the law, that's the that's the route. Um, you have some tough conversations with clients when, you know, I, I, I think back to a call I had to a wo woman that was on the phone and I just told her that, you know, she didn't have a case. And she started telling me about how she's talked to four or five lawyers and nobody will help her. And I said, well, I've been on the phone with you for 20 minutes. I helped you. You just didn't like my help. And, and it, it, she looked at it differently. And I think when you give them that fight, you know, one of the best clients I ever had for referring cases to me was a client where he, two other lawyers had turned his case down. We tried it against probably at that point, the number one employer in St. Cloud, um, St. Cloud, Minnesota, which is the basis one of, one of my offices is, and we lost, okay, lost very close. It was a, I think it was a 60, 40 or a 55. It was, it was way close as far as it goes, but that client saw that we fought for him. The, 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 at the end of it, uh, another lawyer had a case against the same company, settled this case within a couple of weeks because their, their, uh, manager went, holy cow, we could have lost that trial. Um, so, you know, if you, if you fight for people and they know you fight for them and you're willing to talk to them about those things, it's, it's a little bit easier, but you know, I, I, that there isn't clients out there that now are mad at me that settled their case 10, 15 years ago because they're still in pain and still having problems. I, I'm realistic about that. I, the more money I get for people, the worst off they are. Um, and you'll get people that'll come in and say, oh yeah, I had a case years ago. I don't remember who my lawyer is. 
I hope people remember that what I did for them, but I can understand that they don't want to think about the experience that they had because it's not a good experience. When you have to come see me, it's because of bad things. And I accept that. And of course, there's the reality of, of insurance. If you've got a catastrophic injury yep. and a very small insurance policy, you've got to have that discussion with the client that there's only a certain amount of money available to them. That's not an easy conversation either. No, oh, no. I mean, and, and, you know, it's that it, when you have that small policy or you have that kind of middle policy, you know, and then alternatively, you got some cases where there's tons of coverage and the defense, the defense lawyer, or the insurance company is acting like, well, we don't care because we got tons of coverage. You're never going to hit us that big. So they, they do worse. So it, it, it kind of all, there's good, good and bad about all of it. You know, um, you know, as a law clerk, I thought, you know, probably me and one of the clerks used to talk about it. We thought the easiest cases would be involved in was wrongful death cases because clients dead and you just get money and that's all they are. Holy cow. I mean, there's so many complications with everything. There's issues you got to deal with and you just learn with over time and, and, and you're dealing with real people and the effect it has on people. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy, but it's, you know, it's, I like doing it. And when you get somebody justice, you get somebody a good result. Um, you know, it's kind of weird when I, when I did my Aboda thing and I went into the hundred cases that I had to qualify for the top level there. When I went through my trials, I could tell you every single loss I ever had a trial. I, I could think about that trial. I knew about it. And there were a lot of wins. I was like, yeah, that was a good win, but I couldn't, think about it. So, you know, I still retry cases in my head all the time and think about cases all the time and think about clients all the time in ways that I don't think they even realize that, you know, it does have an effect on you. You provide alternative means of recovery for them, like, you know, social security disability or uh, workers comp or what have you. I, I presume you, you evaluate the entire situation, not yeah, just I, that. I don't do workers comp and don't do social security, but I get them to people that do that. Um, there's, there's people that I know that are, that are very good at that, uh, that that's all they do. And I try to get them to the right place. You know um, you know, I don't know if you've talked about it, you know, many times in your podcast, but like your, your um, uh, a lawsuit financial, you know, every once in a while, that's an option for people. So there's different things that we talk to clients about that are important for people at different times and they need for those kind of recoveries. My, my other business has not really been discussed on this podcast, but thanks for the plug. I appreciate it. Okay. Lawsuit Financial is a company, Bob, that, uh, that provides uh, advances to clients who are waiting for cases to resolve. So okay. we, try to help, we try to help them financially while the case is still pending. Okay, and, and then and then Michael, somebody like Michael would would pay us uh, our money back after the case results. I see. I have a question that is probably pretty basic, but perhaps some of our listeners who are not lawyers might uh, might wonder about if if somebody is is uh, gravely injured in a in an accident, but their insurance policy has low coverages. That means that they can't, no matter how seriously they're injured, they can't recover anything more than what's in their insurance policy? Well, it, it depends. Okay. Um, first thing, they want to make sure that's the only policy. Um, there was a case, you know, we've had multiple cases, but the one I, 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 uh, I, I, I think overall, as far as a firm we're most proud of is my partner went and looked at a case where the person had been offered what they, they was being told was the only policy. And when he was done, he was able to find five policies. Um, so once he looked at it and looked at all the potential coverages and all the potential defendants, he found, I think, I, I think it went from a $50,000 potential settlement to $560,000 settlement. Tell, tell him about underinsured and uninsured motorist coverage. Sure. So that he understands. It, in, in car accidents in Minnesota, there's the policy of the driver, and there's also the policy of the owner of the vehicle that needs to be looked at. And potentially, sometimes the car is owned by a company, or there's some other defendants involved, or the person could be drinking, so there might be a bar involved. So there's these potential policies that are defendants' policies. 
Then in Minnesota, on top of it, you have what's called underinsured motorist coverage, which is additional coverage that you have on top of whatever the defendant has. And depending on the circumstance, if you're not in your car when you get hit, you start with the car you're in, and then you go to the car that you have if you have more coverage. So if, if say, the car you're in has, say, 50,000 of underinsured motorist coverage, but you personally have 100,000, you are able to make a claim for the 50 and the additional 50, which is the difference between the two policies for UIM. So, so that's where someone who's experienced can come into it and find more coverage. But to get back to your basic question, Bob, sometimes that's the only policy there is. And if that's the only policy there is, then as I explain it to people, there's three steps to that. First thing is we want to make sure all the bills are paid. Okay. We want to make sure, you know, that we've, you know, gone to the carpet with every single bill to say, you know, here's the coverage we got. Here's what we can do. And we get every cover. So people don't come out owing a bunch of bills. Second, we need to make sure that all the subrogations are paid. And what subrogation is, is health insurance companies or disability policies that pay for bills. We want to make sure that they're taken care of so that somebody doesn't show up 10 years later and say, hey, I can't get Medicare because I didn't pay them back on that case that you handled for me way back before. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is we figure out what's left. And hopefully I can get my costs back that I put into it and I can get my clients some money. I personally, as a firm, make it so that I never get more money than my client. So if our third ended up being more than they'd get, I work out some deal with them so that they can get more money. Because to me, it, I, I work for them. They don't work for me. Um, but you do have tragic cases like that where people have horrible injuries and there's only limited amounts of coverage. And theoretically, you could go after the, bun the, the person individually, you know, if you didn't take the insurance money, but very rarely does, you know, J. Paul Getty run around with, you know, 30,000 in coverage. You know, if they had the money, they probably have more coverage is more likely. Bob, I'd like to, I'd like to supplement his answer, if I may. Uh, the, the answer to your question depends on who, on who causes your accident. As, as Michael said, if you're, if you're hit by somebody who is of substantial means, they will typically have a lot of insurance, but they also are personally liable and, and might be liable over and above the insurance policy. The second very important advice that he just gave, but didn't really emphasize it, is underinsured motorist coverage. People who are buying insurance tend to purchase the cheapest insurance available, and they tend to be advised by their agents to buy inexpensive insurance. What we should be doing is evaluating coverage and protecting ourselves. And what I would advise you and all of our listeners is underinsured motorist coverage and uninsured motorist coverage is the most important coverage you can buy because it protects you. What we typically buy insurance for is to protect the guy that we cause an accident against. Now we're protecting ourselves from having to pay that guy. I get that. But we don't protect ourselves in, the, in that very situation where the guy hits us and has very little or no coverage. So I encourage all of our listeners to buy as much underinsured and uninsured motorist coverage as you can buy. Um, so I, I, just a little supplement to Mike's answer. Final question for me, Bob. Um, and I asked this question of all of my guests on Justice Counts. What does the word justice mean to you, Michael? Oof. Um, justice is, can be incredibly harsh. Um, you know, our, our motto for a firm is justice for the injured. And every once in a while, you realize how harsh justice can be. Um, it is, to me, it's getting people um, solutions in a way that is non violent. Um, it is, it is, a, it, it's what our system is and should be. It's, it's a, it's a system of, of rights that people have that, that, that are, are, um, actualized. Um, so justice is, I mean, justice sometimes can be incredibly harsh. I mean, it's horrible when you sit there sometimes and you think, oh my God, that was justice in the end. Um, but the reality is, is getting people their rights and getting them used in the way that they're supposed to under the Constitution. Um, you know, the Constitution is an incredibly beautiful document. 
it's amazing how 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 solid of a document it is when you look at it overall and it's led our country in a lot of different ways and at the same time you know it's it's still you know we've only been around for you know we're still only we're still a relatively new country compared to the rest of the world out there but um it keeps getting challenged it's been more challenged in the last couple of years than than anything um but justice to me is is that is that is our rights and what our country stands for michael bryant minnesota civil trial specialist Thanks for joining us on Justice Counts. Thanks. Michael, thanks for joining us today on Justice Counts. It was an informative and fascinating conversation. And Mark Bellow and I are grateful. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Meanwhile, if you haven't done so already, please check out Mark Bellow's Rip from the Headlines Legal Thrillers, all available online at Amazon and other major online booksellers. You know, he has quite the hero in attorney Zachary Blake, who fights for justice on all fronts. His books are Betrayal of Faith, Betrayal of Justice, Betrayal in Blue, Betrayal in Black, Betrayal High, and Supreme Betrayal, and just out, Betrayal at the Border. For more information, just check markmbello.com. Until next time, this is Bob Gaddy for Mark Bello signing off from Justice Counts.